It finally feels like fall here at the homestead. It is mid-November and I have to say, oh look, Fabka's here, hold on. I gotta introduce you. So this is Fabka. We call her that because she looks like she's Bobka's offspring, but she hasn't really gotten used to humans yet. You can see if I get a little closer, there she goes, she's gonna go away. So I've gotten about two inches from her, but she's been hanging out a lot. So we've been feeding her. You can see we've got our other hens. We've got the main flock over here. So some interesting changes, but in this video, what I wanna do is share with you some thoughts I have and mistakes I think I've made as I've planned this homestead over three years and how I plan to correct them once and for all this fall, winter, and into the coming year. Let's start out with the backyard garden area, the in-ground garden. You guys know it's been through a few transformations already. This spot right here used to be eight small beds with two large beds over there. This year it was a huge bed here and then two beds and a trellis over here. But what do you not see in this area besides this right here? That is right, you see zero pathways, which I think is one of the most important parts to designing a homestead that I've just more or less completely neglected. So when you walk around in this one paved area, you wanna think, where am I naturally trying to go? Well, I'm definitely trying to go over towards the greenhouse. And so what we've done is we move these whiskey barrels over to open this up as a potential future pathway. Now I want one splitting off here going to my pond patio, and then of course the pond. That flagstone will probably also split off this way and go straight over here, so I can get into the greenhouse really easily. Long shadow type of day. Pop in here and do my work. I also want something coming around this side so I can get to the back side of the pond, just like this. So I, this is like my normal path of walking, and then I wanna be able to come around here, probably in this way, walk around my Pride of Madeira right here, up and over, and voila, I'm now on this other part of the property. So honestly, to figure out where the future pathways went this weekend, I just walked around the backyard and pretended like I was going to all these different areas, and the natural place I wanted to walk, that's where I decided to lay my pathways. I'll show you a couple more over here. So when you come off the back of this patio area, ignore the mess, you've got the shed, right? And so the shed, obviously you want a little pathway here, and I even thought, why not put a ramp right here so you can just slightly get in there? And then you're gonna come and buzz the tower over here. Got the hens. Cause I come out every morning or the girlfriend comes out every morning to feed the hens. And we just walk this path every single time. And we turn this way, we walk over to here. And so I'm gonna grab some snacks every morning and throw it right there. Why would I not beautify this space with a little pathway? So something I would have done very early on in my homesteading journey is figure out where things were. You guys remember the shed was one of the first projects that went in. If I knew that, I should have started defining pathways sooner because it helps you design the rest of the space. When I look at this blank space, I'll be honest, once we clear this garden out for the season and we're redoing it, I felt a little paralyzed. I didn't really know what to put here because there's just nothing to define the space. So you can expect some pathways coming in. We'll show you a couple different ways to build them. But then in this area where the garden's actually gonna be, I want pathways that I can redo. And that kind of brings us to the design of this space in general. I've gone through a couple different iterations here and to be honest, none of them really felt right. This eight mini beds here just was hard to irrigate, hard to manage. This large plot, similar problem, but for different reasons, too big instead of too small. And so what I think I'm gonna do is do a little DIY sort of cottage garden approach where I've got a cute little fence that demarcates this garden area. And then I'm gonna do standard row style crops Maybe, maybe not, I'm still undecided on that, but no matter what, I am going to define this space with some sort of fence. So now if you think about this backyard view, you've got a couple paths going this way, nice and defined. This arch probably moves over here because what you do is you come off here, you can go to the shed, you can go this way, or you can enter the garden from here. Maybe a nice arch, maybe two arches kind of going back, and then you've got a fence sort of lining this all out, looks really nice. Then you get to the area that we've used as a cover crop, as a dahlia patch, as a sunflower patch, as a wheat field. And again, go to the use case of the space for how to best design it. Clearly, I wanna do something different in this area every single season, kind of like the test patch here at the homestead. And so I figured, why not respect that choice and make it a very flexible space? And I'll show you how we do it. So this line here is where that space pretty much began. And you can tell we've already expanded it. I've expanded it out about three feet. Why? Because I don't need about a six foot pathway to walk down here. It's just wasted inefficient space. And so what we're doing is 
If you imagine coming off the greenhouse path here, you'll walk over this way and you'll be able to kind of just walk in right through here. We're gonna have a Corton steel edge here and then you're gonna come out to this far and you'll have another three foot path right down this greenhouse channel, but all this space can be used for larger scale grows and experiments. And then that's gonna continue all the way back here, going over to right here. So in this case, what I've done is basically just optimize the space. I've expanded it out because I don't need six foot pathways. There's simply nothing that I need to be running through this area that requires that much clearance. So why not use the space better? And then I'm gonna use Corton edging because frankly, this slopes. So when you get to the back wall where the mural is, the fall is about three feet or so. And so when you have big rains, you do get some wash that goes straight into the pond onto the patio over there. It's just not a good idea. And so I'm going to use Corton to sort of terrace in this test garden so that hopefully it retains a little bit more water, a little bit more structure that doesn't get washed down the slope of the backyard. Then you've got a couple of these random items here. First off, this is the very first bed I built ever when I was at the homestead and I have to say, it might be time to retire it. Now the challenge is this asparagus bed. If I could redo it, it wouldn't be the first place I put an asparagus bed because that's a 20, 30 year bed. I would probably put it maybe up against the wall somewhere a little further away because it's quite frankly dormant for a good portion of the year or in fern stage for a good portion of the year. There's only like a couple months where you're actually harvesting the spears. So if I know that, I could locate it way further away from the active spot of the garden and just kind of keep it as one of those forever perennial things. But randomly I decided to put it here. And of course the greenhouse is right behind me. It's just kind of an inopportune position. I might do the unthinkable and transition it, but I'm going to clear this back space out and hopefully get in some more trees. But if I want a chance at getting any sort of trees or crops back here, I'm gonna to have to clear out all this debris. We call this the cesspool here. We've got river rocks from the pond, got old rocks from the flagstone, weird mulch piles, the mural, poor avocados and a bunch of wood. And then you get to the pond area. Fabka seems like she's following us around. There she goes, see what I mean? Give me tips on how to befriend a stray because I haven't figured it out yet. But here in the pond, I'm pretty proud of the way that this is developed. I would say 50% of the plantings took, about 50% did not. So I'm going through and I'm gonna replant it. It's a great time of year right now to start putting in like your ground covers, your perennials, especially that aren't frost sensitive. It's a good time to establish them because heat wise could not get that done up until basically early November, which is crazy. I mean, the mosquitoes are still out, the heat is still out. So I'm coming through and I'm gonna be re-landscaping this area right here underneath my dad's memorial bench. Basically what we did is we broad forked in about a foot and then added even more compost to loosen this soil up because this was all just fill dirt from when we dug the pond out. And so if you come around here, you can see the Pride of Madeira has really exploded. This thing was tiny when it first started. And then you've got plants like the leptospermum here that are completely dead and getting frankly overtaken by the passion fruit. And this is something I've really learned with the homesteading journey is knowing the time scale of the stuff you're planting and what you want it to do. I know passion fruit is a quick growing crop that just basically covered over this entire cistern in a year, but the leptospermum, the pride. If I had known I wasn't gonna use this area sooner and I had sort of properly planned out the space, I'd probably have a two-year-old one instead of a half a year old one and I would just have a much more beautiful space. Then we come around here, Fabka's back eating. Oh, gone again. We saw you eating that food. We've been buying some cat food. But then we get underneath the awning, say hello to the guys. You got Charlie here, you got Ian here, they're on the team couple of botanical interest prints coming soon. Let me show you what we're doing. So this area back here under the awning has kind of been like this free for all area with a lot of weird elements that I don't really like. So what I'm gonna do is we're finally gonna finish this. And you can look, remember way back when we did the roof project, you can see all the screws and nails just coming out of the ceiling, which is clearly not ideal. And then you've got the floor, which is degrading as we speak. The paint's just sort of chipping off, looks really bad, and then the mosquitoes this year have been absolutely terrible. So I think what we're gonna do is screen in this area. So I have this like back porch we can all work in, we can hang out in, have some social time, and it actually feels comfortable because honestly guys, the house is tiny. It's like a thousand square foot house, two people live in it, my girlfriend and I, and then we have people over working and hanging out, chilling, filming videos for you guys all the time. If I got another 440 square feet out in the awning, it almost adds 50% to the square footage of my home. So I am super down for that. Oh, 
Paul just showed up. <laughs> he almost ate it. What do you got for us, Paul? Got a little shredder. Little chip of shred. Yeah, that's hard. Experiment. Oh, or the leaves. Don't 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 tempt me. Don't tempt me. <laughs> We're doing a cool experiment pretty soon on the main channel where we are trying to make compost as fast as humanly possible. Probably be up by the time you see this, but some of the things I'm thinking about, it, a lot of it is that guys, a lot of it is how do you plan out things that take the time and things you can do quickly, right? So as we go over to the orchard, obviously if I knew every plant I wanted to plant in my orchard, I would have just done it sooner, right? These trees, these citrus right here, a lot smaller than these citrus over here, and if I had just perfectly known, well then I definitely would have just done that. I just gave these guys a prune. So these are huge, right? Then you get down there, they're tiny. And I have some of my favorite varieties over there that are tiny. Then you got the palms. Palms are looking really nice. I would say I need to add about 10-ish more fruit trees to the homestead, and that's where this empty space is really coming into play. I wanna say by next year I'll have a plan here, but I need to keep into account all the stuff I just told you figure out where the paths go, figure out where the perennials go, any of the structures, any of the sort of decor, the, the accoutrements, so to speak, and then I can get those trees in. Because the sooner I do it, the sooner I'm getting fruit. I think we're actually gonna get another round of artichoke, weirdly. Normally they, they're dead by now, because it's mid-November and you've cut them back, but it seems like they're all coming up a little bit early. Then the other cool addition we put in, my girlfriend and I were on a walk once, we saw bougainvillea as orange and we said, definitely need one of those. So we planted it right here next to this defunct fireplace at the property. And then we used the same setup we used for the grape trellis, this sort of wire structure. We put it all the way up. See how it kind of zigzags up there? So we've been training it all the way up there. And by the time it gets up, we'll maybe sort of put some structure here, structure here, have it cover part of the house, which I know a lot of you are probably saying, yo, that's crazy, but I grew up with a bougainvillea. My grandma loves bougainvillea. She's Filipino, she says bougainvillea. And so, I don't know, to me, bougainvillea, it's part of the garden, I want it here at the homestead. So there've been a ton of updates this year, but honestly, so many mistakes I've made in the process of building out this homestead that if and when I get another property, I'll be honest, I've been looking at five acre plots all around the country. I've been thinking about it. I've been biding my time. Maybe some perfect situation will come up because I really want to experiment with larger scale growing. I just can't do it on about a third of an acre here, but still a lot left to learn here at the homestead. And remember, the Epic Homesteading book comes out spring 24. Signed copies still available for pre-order. You can do that right now. And let me know what you guys think about these episodes. I have a lot of fun just kind of riffing off the top like I used to do, but I know we have a lot of fun with Jacques here on the channel and a little bit more edited style. So if you like some of these as an interstitial little break from the madness of Jacques and I, then let me know. Good luck in the garden and keep on growing.